Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation, Using Natural Therapies in the Menopause Transition. My name is Elizabeth Farrell. I'm a gynaecologist and uh, director, medical director and one of the founding members here at Jean Hales. Firstly, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we're presenting on and the lands we're reaching tonight. I'm in Melbourne on the land of the Wurundjeri and Boonarong peoples of the Kulin Nation. I recognise their continuing connections to land, water and culture and pay our respects to elders past, present and future. For those of you who don't know, Jean Hales for Women's Health is a natural, nat oh natural, we are very natural, uh, not-for-profit organisation, national, um, dedicated to improving the knowledge of women and girls' health by combining research, clinical care and practical education for women and health professionals. You can see I've got a bit of word finding problems already. <laughs> Tonight's webinar is recorded and we will advise you when it's ready to view on our Jean House website. You can link to the, present, uh, sorry, the presentation slides in the resource tab at the top right of your screen. We thank you for sending in your questions and if time, we will aim to answer them at the end of the webinar. You can also submit questions tonight via the Q&A tab at the top right of your screen. If you have any technical difficulties, please call the number on the player page below the screen. Don't submit your problem as a question. If you require a certificate or RACGP points, you need to complete the evaluation questionnaire. This will come up as a link on the screen at the end of the webinar. Joining me tonight is our naturopath at Jean House, Sandra Valella. Sandra has been with us since 1999 and uh, is a naturopath of nearly 30 years experience. Her interest in women's health is across the life stages, particularly in the management of the menopause. She's keen to bridge the gap between natural therapies and conventional medicine to achieve true complementary health. Jean Hales is aware that the area of complementary medicine and therapies is sometimes considered controversial amongst health professionals. We know that at Jean Hales that women are interested in complementary options for managing their health, so we consider it an important area of discussion. We know that women are the biggest users of complementary medicines and therapies, and we feel it is our role to assist women in their decision making by providing information without a commercial bias. Last year, Jean Hales conducted a survey of our health professional audience to find out about their learning needs. We received responses from almost a thousand GPs, nurses, and other disciplines. Natural therapies in women's health was one of the top four topics for skill development and menopause was number one requested for skill development. So tonight's webinar is in response to this. So as an introduction, the current recommendations by world experts in menopause suggest that the benefits of MHT outweigh the risks for healthy menopausal women. Menopause hormone therapy, that's what MHT is. We've got rid of HT, although the Americans still use that, and we've got rid of HRT. We now talk about menopause hormone therapy. It's a unique experience for every woman, and there are a range of management and treatment options available. So there are healthy lifestyle cho choices, complementary medicines and therapies, menopause hormone therapy, non-hormonal prescriptive therapies, also, there is data on cognitive behavioural therapy and hypnotherapy, which may assist with symptoms. Jean Howe strongly advocates that women take a balanced, evidence-based and informed approach to their health care. All risks and benefits should be considered when deciding to use MHT and other management options, including natural therapies. Sandra, women are increasingly using natural therapies alongside or instead of MHT to manage their yes. symptoms. Why do you think this is? 
I think mostly, Liz, it's about personal choice. So women like to make a, an informed decision about what they want to do. And for a lot of women, they want to use something that's natural. And so they will go to these menopause, these therapies that are the complementary medicines. So we now have a preferred term. Sometimes we used to refer to these as alternative therapies or natural therapies, but now the preferred term is complementary medicine and therapies. I think women also um, sometimes have a either a perceived or a real risk of perhaps the other alternative of menopausal hormone therapy, and they want to use this as a, a different option. So for example, some women where it's contraindicated, where they've had an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, for example, and I know a lot of the women that I see that you send to me are often in this cohort. Mm. That's right. So, so one of the things that um, I just wanted to yeah. say um, that you're going to talk about complementary therapies and medicines. But one of the things I think as a health professional, we should always ask patients Absolutely. what medicines are they taking, including yes. what they, that they've purchased across the counter or from uh, naturopaths or other uh, alternative It's really therapists. important because I know, and like that's one of the things that I'm going to look at to see that there is no interactions, but the other way around as well, that we need to make sure that everyone's on board. But I think one of the one of the issues that we know is that women are not necessarily, if they are self-prescribing natural therapies, they're not choosing the right remedy. So if we know from a study that was done in Australia by some of our clinicians who were involved as well, that about 13% of women were self-prescribing um, using these complementary medicines and therapies for the, the use of for, for the treatment of hot flushes. And the three top things that they used were not were not even in the top three that I would consider. So even in primrose oil, which we know has been shown to be no better than a, a dummy pill, than a placebo for the treatment of hot flushes. Then they were using phytoestrogens, which we will talk about quite a bit in a little bit in a bit of time. And the other third choice was Panax ginseng. And we will talk about Panax ginseng as perhaps being useful for perhaps some of the sexual function, but women are using, they, they're, they're not sourcing their information from the right sources. And I think that's partly of what we're trying to achieve tonight. So let's now talk about symptoms and management of menopause. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about the various different um, symptoms and how many people get symptoms. So we think that about 20% of women will have minimal or no symptoms. About 60% will have symptoms that can decrease their quality of life, but they can manage or they might still require request therapies. We know that symptoms can last on a median scale. So if you look at a median chart, eight years is the median duration of symptoms but four to eight years. And remember that there is still a significant but small number of women who have bothersome symptoms in the 60s and 70s. And there are the 20% of women who have severe symptoms and their quality of life is really impacted. Now, if we look at the different symptoms around the menopause, the classic symptoms of the menopause are flushing, hot flushes, and night sweats in particular, or just feeling hot so that you feel that the, your whole body is hotter. We look at the genitourinary symptoms and vaginal dryness, painful intercourse. And then if we look at bladder symptoms, urinary frequency, stress incontinence, and urgent, urgency and urge incontinence tend to occur more after the menopause. Around the perimenopause, we're more likely to see mood changes, irritability, mood swings, feeling teary, not coping as well, lowered mood, anxiety. And in women who have a history of mood disorder, they may have another episode occurring in that perimenopausal period. If we look at the physical symptoms, Formication is itchy skin. It's a bit like ants under the skin. And that's a menopause symptom. Muscle aches and pains, very common and nearly up to 50% in some studies. Weight gain, that's really a whole topic yes. for another discussion. Headaches and migraines are often present in the perimenopause and may be related to the cycle and bloating. 
Along with the vasomotor symptoms, you're going to get a sleep disturbance. So then that may lead to uh, insomnia, lowered concentration, fatigue, low energy, and word finding difficulties. So <clears throat> I want to really talk a yeah. bit about the perimenopause. Yes. Now, I think it's important to think about definitions. We talk about pre-menopause. That mean, means before the cycles become irregular. Perimenopause is the transition leading up to the final menstrual period. And the menopause is the final menstrual period. And 12 months after that final period, we can say that a woman is postmenopausal and she's postmenopausal till stumps. Yes. So when we look at the perimenopause, the perimenopause can have very high levels of estrogen and progesterone and low levels. So in the perimenopause, we can have, it, we, there is evidence, and that evidence comes from research done in Sydney showing that in the perimenopause, women can have anovulatory yes. cycles, but they can also ovulate twice in a menstrual cycle. It's called a luteal out-of-phase ovulation, mm -hmm. and that second ovulation can occur at a time of the period. So it's important when we're talking about the perimenopause that we discuss contraception with a woman. Yes. One of the symptoms that does increase in or can increase in the perimenopause is PMS. Do you want to talk about how you would manage PMS? Yes, I think with PMS, you know, women will often say, is it perimenopause? Is it is it PMS? And in fact, you can get this, of course, a worsening of PMS in this in this phase. And one of the herbs that is most commonly thought about being used at this time, or in fact for PMS generally, is, is Vitex agnus castus or chase tree. And we wanted to talk about this tonight particularly because there's a lot of inappropriate use of this. And in fact, it is a, a herb that has a very real action. And I personally think it shouldn't be available over the counter because of the real action it has and ha should be prescribed by someone who is trained in its use. So what what it has been used for is the uh, it's been clinically trialed for menopause generally and so a range of symptoms from mood changes to some of the physical symptoms like nostalgia and um, and fluid retention there is some use for it in the perimenopausal pre pms uh, in terms of helping with regulating cycle it can often be used to help to reinstate ovulation if indeed the woman still has eggs it's not going to keep making the woman ovulate if indeed she doesn't have eggs. So it can help to regulate the cycle and in some cases help where there's some irregular bleeding so because of anovulatory bleeding. But it should be prescribed appropriately. So, you know, you can pick up one over the counter and one brand will say take it three times a day from day 14 to day 30. Another one will say take it twice a day. Traditionally, it is always taken in the morning from day one of the period and keep taking it. I know a lot of my colleagues say you need to take breaks uh, if you're taking it and, and it's working, you keep taking it until it's no longer working. So there's lots of maybe and, and if. So it really is something that so should be... So you take it continuously. You take it continuously until in this phase, if a woman has not had a period for six months, in, then you can stop taking it. So it has been uh, approved for PMS by the German Commission E. There's lots mm -hmm. of, of studies for are done on it. Considered safe, arguably one of the authors conclude that it's it's possibly tolerated better than conventional hormone or, or SSRIs for, for PMS. Um, just one question about that. Do we know what how it works? Ah, that's a good question. So we know somehow it works on the message system between the brain, the hypothalamus and the and the ovary. So on this HPA axis, on this HPO axis. There is some research that's talking about particular compounds in it called diterpenoids that perhaps work on opioid receptors or they work on estrogen receptors. I think that's like the $64,000 question as to how it works. And it may work, have a direct ovarian function sometimes the way it works. It's not an, it's not an estrogenic herb, but it seems to sort of work in a number of ways. But I, look, I'd love to know how it works myself, but yes. More research. Meant more research. Now, we want to talk a bit about the classic symptoms of the menopause, the vasomotor symptoms. So if you're in the um, European, um, UK, Australia, you'll call them hot flushes. 
uh, if you are in America, you'll call them hot flashes. Yes. And associated with hot flushes can be night sweats, but women can have them during the day and at night, but classically at night, waking up X number of times. It might be once, it might be 10. Uh, it depends on the severity of the symptoms. So if I send my patient to you, what are you going to prescribe yes. and why? So it's good to, let's, let's talk about evidence starting, um, first of all. A lot of the, the herbs we're going to talk about, apart from black cohosh, the evidence that is there is based on smaller studies, around 100 women per, per study. So that's not fantastic in short term. Evidence, in short term. The one, but in, when we talk about black cohosh, we'll see that there's a lot more evidence. I don't know why we're starting with hops, maybe because it's our aperitivo with the beer. And, and, and yes, hops is found in beer. And um, unlike alcohol, which can often worsen night sweats and often worsen sleep disturbance, one of the ingredients in beer is hops. And hops is a, a herb that contains a potent phytoestrogen. And traditionally, hops is used as a hypnotic, so it's useful for sleep and it's, it's a sedative. So the combination of hops being useful as a, for a sleep remedy and hot flushes uh, is useful for night sweat and anxiety. Um, traditionally, this herb is contraindicated in severe depression, and I caution it in its use with women in breast cancer. Uh, we were talking about this before. The, when I started looking at the research, some of the in vitro studies are suggesting perhaps it doesn't stimulate breast tissue, but I am a little bit cautious. But the herb that has had the most research is black cohosh. And it's particularly used for the vasomotor symptoms, aches and pains, vaginal dryness, mood disturbances. And in Europe, it's particularly used in combination with St. John's wort. And the combination works, tends to work typically very well for a range of menopausal symptoms, including for low mood. Something to be aware of is that for some women, it can cause headaches. And I find that particularly with women who are a bit prone to menstrual headaches or menstrual migraines. And we do know that there is a, a warning that is on a lot of our labels because a few years ago there was some correlation with it being related to liver damage. And the long and short of it is uh, over, uh, out of all of those 69 cases, Therapeutics Goods Administration, the European Medicines Evaluation Committee have looked at it and concluded that probably one of those cases was possibly related. And it's not because black cohosh is a herb that causes liver damage, but it was an idiosyncratic, like an allergic reaction. But it's still got the warning. It still has to have the warning. And the TGA, in fact, say, you know, given its widespread use, it's safe to use, but they still have the warning. A lot of people will rely on the Cochrane Review of 2012, which kind of poo-poos this herb and says, in fact, you know, there's insufficient evidence to support the use of this, um, this herb for menopausal symptoms. That research, even though the Cochrane generally has a very high level of evidence, was internationally criticised following the publication because it excluded many of the trials that actually showed benefit. And they didn't, the, one of the other things that they didn't show is the differentiation between the extracts used. It's, it's, it's like oranges and apples. Oils ain't oils when it comes to black cohosh. The most recent evidence that was done with this, this meta-analysis in 2021, looking at over 43,000 women, it really did make the distinction between the standardised black cohosh extracts, which do show effic efficacy, compared to just, you know, picking some from your garden or any sort of over-the-counter type of one. And in fact, it was its efficacy was comparable to low-dose transdermal estradiol as a result of this, or tibolone. There was no evidence of hep hep hepatotoxicity in this one. The hormone levels remained unchanged. And that's important to remember that black cohosh is not an estrogenic herb. It does not stimulate estrogen receptors. And in fact, it tends to work more on those pathways that are like the serotonin, dopaminergic kind of pathways, particularly. And there wasn't any, influ there wasn't any evidence that showed that it influenced negatively the breast or the endometrium. So again, there was a, they looked at it in combination with black cohosh and, and St. John's wort, and they showed that that was also quite a good combination and good safety profile, and particularly at estrogen sensitive organs, it was uh, useful for those symptoms. Um, just a little question about when you say different extracts, mm. can you just yes. tell us a little bit about that? So the standardised extracts, a lot of the original research was done on remifemin 
and also some of the standardised extracts would be also like, for example, Femula and Femula Fort. So the, the doses of that and the particular extracts that are used were, were showing greater efficacy. So um, um, one of the things that um, perhaps those people don't know, Remy Femin is a brand name for uh, a black cohosh product and Femula Fort is a brand name for another uh, black cohosh yes. product that are available across the counter here in Australia. Now, let's talk a little bit about migraine and the menopause. Mm. But migraine, I wonder, is perhaps more seen in the perimenopause yes. than in, than in post-menopause. Mm. This, this time of kind of hormonal chaos. Do you want to talk a little bit about it first, Liz? So the perimenopause is, is as I've mentioned before, the oestrogen levels can be high or low or it can be a double ovulation, there can be an ovulation. So that means that the hormone levels have lost their cyclicity, if I can use that term. And that leads to, at some stages, probably fairly sharp rises and falls of, of ovarian hormones. And it's thought perhaps a sudden drop in hormones might have an effect on vascular stability, which could be cause in those who are vulnerable uh, to get a headache or a migraine. Would that be yes. your sort and of I, take know, on it? Yes, and I know, and that drop in oestrogen that occurs, typically that, that just typical sort of physiological drop that occurs mm -hmm. will be that trigger. And I know you and I have talked about saying, and you've said, well, that's usually when we would use a menopause or like an oestrogen patch. Oestrogen, mm -hmm. And in fact, it was that oestrogen patch idea to offset that drop that made me think about, well, what if we used phytoestrogens in the same way. So it started me on a bit of a journey to look at and seeing whether we could use dietary phytoestrogens to mitigate that drop. I did a little bit of a, a, a literature review and there was some evidence in the, in the literature that talked about using a dose of around 60 or 70 milligrams of isoflavones. I started experimenting and getting women to use about 50 milligrams in their diet. And I'll talk about what that looks like. It, when And then when I looked at the research, the, the dose was suggesting a little bit more. So what I started doing was getting women in that three to five days before their period, day one to day three, to use the equivalent of about 100 grams of tempeh or 200 grams of tofu in that time. In fact, I created a phytoestrogen loaf that if you have two thick slices of that phytoestrogen loaf, to see if that would mitigate that drop and sometimes it was the difference between a migraine and a headache or no headache at all. And I went on and I, I did I present a paper and a, um, a poster in a Barcelona at Barcelona at a conference. But this the, there's a hand there's a slide in the notes will talk about how you can try and get that dose of sixty to seventy milligrams. So it really is it started out as practice based evidence really. So we'll see how where that goes. Mm, mm. And um, another obviously symptom is sleep disturbance mm. and I think one of the things that we note from the literature that in the perimenopause and clinically we note that women can sometimes develop wakefulness in the perimenopause yes. and they just wake up suddenly mm. in the middle of the night not hot or anything like that no. and that seems to be in the perimenopause then if they develop flushes and sweats particularly at night then they're going to wake up some people can just turn over and go back to sleep. Other people have to get up, change their nighty, change yes. their sheets if it's really bad, and then they're awake. Yes. And then it's they struggle. And then that leads to fatigue, etc. And then sometimes that hat turns into a insomnia it and does. a sleep disturbance. I think it's one of the most challenging symptoms to manage, but I think it's also one of the most disturbing symptoms for women to experience because it really does impact on their quality of life. You know, it can p impact on their weight because, you know, we know that sleep has an impact on appetite and weight control. So it has all of these add-on effects. Again, when we look at the what we can do, there are an, a, a couple of studies, three or four, that are looking at, at women at this time and a few herbs that we can look at. Again, these studies are often involving women, around 100 women, either postmenopausal or perimenopausal. There's some no in, in your notes you'll see there's a little bit more information about them. Valerian, typically used. Lemon balm can be used. You know, there's a, a study done with lemon balm and valerian. And Zisyphus is one of my favourites at this time. It's, it's a Chinese herb. 
that is actually um, traditionally used for that overall hot feeling that you talked about. And it is hypnotic and it is sedative. And I do like it when Zisyphus is, is used in some of these formulations. And so I was pleased to find a small study that looked at that. Now, I think mood is something that many menopausal, perimenopausal, postmenopausal women talk about. But it's probably, as I mentioned before, more specifically in around the perimenopause, which is that time of hormonal, as it were, dysfunction, disorder, up and down nature. I mean, it doesn't happen with everybody, but that can also impair how women function. And then after the periods have stopped and um, they may get the hot flushes, that's going to provoke mood changes if they're tired and exhausted and things like that. How do you go about managing um, yes. these symptoms so in women? Traditionally, if we look at the before the randomised control trials on, on black cohosh, in the old herbal books, black cohosh, so St John's what was traditionally used for perimenopausal menopause, uh, depression. Yes. So we know that that can be useful. It does have interactions with certain medications. So again, the, the need to disclose to your health practitioner that you're taking it. The combination of black cohosh and St John's wort typically, particularly works on helping with the mood. And the other herb that we look at particularly for depression is saffron. Um, so yes, saffron, there's some studies done on that generally for, for depression. And these herbs are said to be serotonin sparing and they can re help with reduction in depression. Not great amounts of studies with um, saffron. There is a good one, a small study done with P um, PMS and saffron and depression, but um, they, they're the two herbs that would typically be used for depression. Mm. And when it comes to anxiety, I've already mentioned hops, and the the, the hops, again, being phyto phytoestrogenic, can be, have that added effect, and also it's an anxiolytic and for the sleep. And one that often is used, probably the best of all of them, is carva carva. Unfortunately, the research doesn't always support its efficacy, particularly with perimenopausal women. And most of these herbs that are working are GABA modulating. So they work on that part of the brain that is, is working with anxiety. But the carva can often be a muscle relaxant. It's it's quite different to going and to Fiji sort of carver house and getting stones. Yes, because yes. you you yes. absolutely think that's yeah. what it was. <laughs> it's the same herb, but it's not narcotic, so it's just that sedative action, and it is um, available in Australia. So how do they get rid of the narcotic action? I'm not sure how they do that. I think it's a different way it's prepared. Yes, no. I'm not sure about that one. Yes. Fair enough. Okay. And now we're going to talk about. The other major area related to the menopause and the postmenopausal changes, and that's vulvar vaginal atrophy or genitourinary syndrome mm. of the menopause. Yes. Now, that term was um, coined because vulvar vaginal atrophy really talks about the vulva and the vagina and doesn't bring into play anything to do with the urinary tract uh, or to do with sexual symptoms, and so. This particular terminology has now been in, uh, is now used for what is potentially the low estrogen in the genitourinary area. Now we know that uh, vulvar vaginal symptoms and genitourinary symptoms occur in more than fifty percent of women, and if we look at the symptoms related to the vagina, dryness, discomfort with intercourse. Um, pain that could be, so women then develop a pelvic floor dysfunction associated with pain. Then the urinary symptoms, we know that there are estrogen receptors in the urethra, base of the bladder. So that also is going to change with the low estrogen. So in urinary frequency, um, increasing urge and urge incontinence and possible stress incontinence uh, loss of elasticity in vaginal and uh, urethral tissues, which may lead to prolapses. Mm. Um, we would use topical preparations as the first choice because some older studies showed that up to 30% of women using systemic th therapy will still have atrophic changes uh, in the uh, vagina and in the bladder. The preparations we have available in Australia are Ovestin or Estriol cream and ovules and Vagifem Low, 
uh, pessaries or vaginal tablets. Now, one of the most important things about the use of vaginal estrogens is, well, there are two things really. One, that progestogens are not required. And in fact, there are probably three things now that come to mind. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that the blood flow to the vagina is not just one supply. And the lower third of the vagina is supplied by the perineal and pudendal vessels. And the upper two thirds of the vagina are supplied by a, um, a branch of the uterine artery. So when you're prescribing vaginal estrogen, instruct the woman to insert the uh, cream ovule or pessary into the lower third of her mm -hmm. vagina. So um, because of um, my age, it's probably just over an inch. That would be about the size that one would insert the applicator or put the pessary in. And the last thing is that uh, studies presented, um, big database studies from the UK were published mm -hmm. in 219 and 220, and one of those showed that women using estrogen vaginally showed no increase in the risks of breast cancer if they used vaginal estrogen alone. And I think that's really important because the PI for vaginal estrogen still says that it does increase, whereas this data says no. The use of vaginal estrogen in women with hormone-dependent cancers, particularly breast cancer, is still controversial. We would use it quite uh, often in women who are taking tamoxifen, but there is still controversy about the use of it in women with aromatase inhibitors. We can use non-hormonal vaginal moisturisers and lubricants in the first choice, and vaginal moisturisers the one that, main one that we have is um, um, called. Essige? Yeah. I've got a yeah. I've got a menopausal um. memory loss now. <laughs> is replens, <laughs> um, and but I think there are others. And then lubricants. You want a lubricant that has an acidic pH, but mm. its osmolality is similar to the vaginal secretions. So not too thin and not mm. too thick. And if you look, there was a very interesting paper published in Climacteric some years ago looking at all of those available. Right. We, would, we would recommend, and it will be in your pack, um, per, yes. per silicon if condoms are not being used, uh, and um, yes, and Astroglide, I think. Yes. And I think there are some others as well. And also using oils. Um, laser therapy, we're still not yes. so happy about. Now, can you yes. talk about? Yes. So we always um, talk about linseeds when it comes to vaginal symptoms and vaginal dryness. And this was, you were talking before, Liz, that you were actually at Prince um, Henry. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, um, I was. So when I was working at Prince Henry's, uh, which no longer exists, a hospital in Melbourne that used to be, um, and uh, oh, I've forgotten the name. Giselle Wilcox, Giselle Wilcox yes. was doing a study on phytoestrogens showing that there was an increase in the, uh, in the actual yes. cells in the vagina related to the use uh, of linseeds. Yes. And then one of our GPs also did a study. So I took that little bit of information that was from 1999. And again, I've been prescribing that dose of 25, 25 grams, which is about two dessert spoons of linseeds per day to help to improve these vaginal cells. So I just say to the women, it's going to plump up those cells and women will report back. So again, practice-based evidence is showing that that's useful. And in fact, I've created a number of recipes, which we'll talk about in a moment. But you know, linseeds are an excellent source of soluble fibre. So we all need, you know, and most Australians aren't getting enough fibre. They're also an excellent source of the plant-based omega-3s. And interestingly, these, um, the Co a Cochrane review that took, kind of threw out the idea of using fish oils for protection for heart disease for women, if you read the fine print said, but actually if you eat the plant-based ALAs, they probably have some benefit with heart disease. So linseeds is a good source of that. You do need to grind them. You can grind them 2x supply and put them in the fridge and then have two dessert spoons or 25 grams. And these are a couple of our remedies. These are a couple of our recipes 
And uh, one of them is linseed, banana and date muffins that in-house we secretly call... The juicy the, vagina yes, muffins. The juicy vagina muffins. Yes. And um, they are quite delicious and they are a gluten-free muffin. And you can also, the breakfast brain topper has just got the 25 grams in it as well. But interestingly, when we were preparing this, the... Tracy asked me, is there anything else that you can look at for, for vagina dryness? And I did come across some novel evidence on using vitamin D. Yes. And so one of the research papers was using vaginally a thousand international units a daily over eight weeks. And another one was using a, a big dose, I think 60,000 was it, over uh, a couple of weeks, every week for a couple of weeks. So, but I've never used it. You've never had a patient that's using vitamin D. No, no I but, don't recall. But watch so, that space. Yes, those yes. are the two trials that uh, you, you noticed. Yes. Um, sexual function, uh, so related to lack of estrogen, uh, lack of estrogen leading to vaginal dryness, mm -hmm. painful sex, mm -hmm. developing into an overactive pelvic yes. floor and loss of desire. Yes. So what can we do for herbal remedies for well i'm glad you said herbal remedies because of course when it comes to desire and sexual function there's a whole range of things ranging from you know whether your partner's put out the rubbish bin to um whether you know what were you talking about before the, the hump of the, hump of, the hump of reluctance so there's a that's a whole nother ball game but you know apart from that what we do know is that it will take a little bit longer to get aroused, so the the desire will come after arousal in perimenopausal women, and but in terms of when we there are a lot of women who will be self prescribing, and there's a whole you know lots of things over the counter, little bit of research on tribulus, which is um which has been shown to improve sexual problems amongst postmenopausal women. These are really small trials. It improves sexual desire, improved arousal, but they they're published they they are published randomised control trials, and this is where Panax ginseng might have a role, and it's improved sexual arousal in menopausal women, and it's traditionally used as what we call an adaptogen, which helps to co improve your resistance to physical and mental stress, which probably can have a role to play in all of this as well. Okay, let's talk about plant oestrogens, mm. because um, there's been a lot of discussion around that yes. over the years, and how how helpful they were. You've talked about your juicy yes. vagina yes. muffins with the linseed, but let's yes. talk about how they work and so what the linseeds. Yes, the linseeds contain lignans, a type of phytoestrogen, and the, these. This slide that you'll have in front of you now is looking at isoflavones that are typically found in soy and also in red clover. And I think this picture shows it quite nicely. It's like about that lock and key mechanism that the plant estrogens have a similar key cut, a key configuration that can fit into the same receptors. But they do behave quite differently to our own endogenous oestrogen. And um, they have, they tend to have a greater affinity for the oestrogen receptor beta, which tend to have a dampening down effect. They don't have that stimulating impact. And in fact, most of these are considered, uh, the, the soy phytoestrogens are considered SERM, selective oestrogen receptor modulators. And there's a lot of misconception about phytoestrogens. You know, I tell my story about being refused a, a soy cappuccino because the barista has told me that it's an endocrine disruptor. And my now retort is actually it's a selective oestrogen receptor modulator because people think because it's an oestrogen, it's going to have an, in, in, uh, an impact um, negatively. But when it comes to treating menopausal symptoms, it's about a third of women may get some benefit. And that's because only a third of the population, men and women, have the bacteria in your gut that converts the phytoestrogens from soy to a more potent phytoestrogen called equal. And those equal producers will possibly get some impact from having about 50 milligrams of isoflavones a day in their diet. And you can't take a probiotic to make that equal happen. You either are an equal producer or not. Right, so red clover. Mm. Um, yes, it's available in the product called Promensal. It's yes. been around for a long time, but you've said it's not a traditional no. herb. So or, it, it's or a traditional herb. It doesn't have a traditional use. herb use in menopause, but it does indeed contain a phytoestrogen. It contains phytoestrogens of isoflavones. Quite a bit of research done on it by by as Promensal. Um, different reviews look at it and it tends to be there's a 40 milligram and 80 milligram and the general consensus is that if you looked at the 80 milligrams a day it showed a reduction in hot flushes of an average about three to four a day 
And it tends to seem to work better in postmenopausal women rather than the perimenopausal women. And the theory is because there's an overall est lower estrogen pool, then perhaps the weak estrogens that are found in these phytoestrogens may be able to sort of, again, sort of create some estrogenic effect and, and, and deal with those lower so estrogen symptoms. So it's a CERM. It's a CERM, yes. It's a selective <clears throat> estrogen receptor modulator. Yep. And and there's no increase in breast density, but do no, we really yeah. know whether we can use it in breast cancer Yes, patients? well, there's a number of trials that they've done that looked at it. A couple of them looked at, two clinical trials looked at, um, we look, used mammogram to see if there was any change in breast density, and there wasn't. There was a 200 uh, women looked at over 12 months where these women was deemed to have an increased risk due to their breast density pattern and there was no increase over 12 months. And then there was a three-year study looking at 40 milligrams of promensal using 400 women who had at least one um, first-degree relative with breast cancer where breast cancer wasn't showing up at least over that time of three years. So we've got data to about three years. Okay, thank you for that. All right, now the next topic that I want to talk about is this confusion about safety and efficacy and what do the terms bioidentical, body identical or pharmacy compounded hormones mean? Mm. And basically they all mean the same thing because all hormones that we prescribe or are compounded have to be made synthetically if they only exist in the human. And so even if the substrate that the pharmaceutical companies make uh, use to make the hormones, which could be a derivative from mm -hmm. the soy, yes. um, genistein, mm -hmm. or, or diosgenin from the yam, they're still synthetically made because they only exist in the human body. So it's really semantics. Pharmacy compounded hormones are no different in terms of their safety, efficacy and quality. Well, they are different, mm -hmm. there is none because doses are individualised and so therefore they're non-TGA and non-FDA approved. We know that compounded progesterone creams may be ineffective in protecting the endometrium. And the reason that we know that is that progesterone does not get absorbed across the skin significantly. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure we would have oestrogen and progesterone patches, but we don't. And so pharmacy compounded hormones, are they bioidentical? Yes, but every oestrogen except for Premarin, and Premarin does have some bioidentical oestrogens in it, all of the oestrogens we, we prescribe are bioidentical. That is, they're exactly the same chemical compound as what the human ovary uh, and tissues produce. So the important thing is that there's not one better than the other. Now, Miss and Faz. Yes, this is what we've been waiting for. Oh, our favourite or favourites, oestrogen dominance. Okay. Testing your hormone levels by saliva, seed cycling. And what we need to talk about is that term natural. I've just talked about natural human hormones, which are estradiol, estriol, estrone, progesterone, mm. testosterone, they're all natural hormones yes. to our bodies. I think when we're talking about natural, a lot of people, you know, they're plant-based, but I guess the caution that we have to have is some of these, you know, these really are still medicines and they can have interactions. I mean, generally they're considered less uh, of a problem, but we still need to be aware that there can be interactions. But they may not have the same uh, clinical effectiveness. No, yes, that's right. So let, but let's start off with this oestrogen dominance. So I've been a naturopath for nearly 30 years and this this oestrogen dominance has been bandied around and I know it confuses uh, the when 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 you're having conversations between the different domains it's like what did what did what did the naturopaths mean when they're talking about it. And we have to be we have to understand what this oestrogen dominance means. It was really coined by Dr. Lee in the late in the early 90s where he had this book that was out which was really promoting natural progesterone. Mm. And the, the, so basically it had, um, the woman could actually have deficient, normal or excessive oestrogen. 
but had little or no progesterone to balance its effect. And if all of those symptoms were basically um, considered estrogen dominance. Now, if you have a look at the list, you've got things here from dry eyes to PMS to zinc deficiency. And some of those, some of those symptoms, if you look at these, you would automatically think are definitely estrogen you know, decline associated with menopause. But irrespective of what we're, you know, all of these are considered to have an estrogen dominance because there isn't any progesterone. So it's all about promoting um, progesterone use. So this is really what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of debunk this. Because what ends up happening is women are being treated inappropriately, really, because if you're looking at trying to, if you've got an estrogen dominance, you want to get, get rid of this estrogen. So, you know, you think about a perimenopausal woman with sleep disturbance, vaginal dryness and vasomotor symptoms, and you're trying to lower her estrogen even further, it's going to worsen it. Absolutely. So there's a lot of confusion around that, particularly. Mm. Okay, now we're up to... We're gonna, should we talk a little bit about seed cycling? Oh, seed oh, yes, cycling, yes. So yes. The, the seed cycling is also... Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. oh. So the seed cycling <clears throat> is also another one that we wanted to talk about because it's... it's, um, uh, it's been promoted on these wellness forums all over the place and apparently if you have these certain seeds at the, in your follicular phase and another type of seeds in your in your luteal phase it's going to uh, sort out all of menstrual problems now these seeds are good seeds they contain linseeds and sunflower seeds and also pepitas and and sesame seeds now i prescribe sesame seeds pepitas the sunflower pepitas and linseeds as a combination for a beautiful combination for constipation it tends to work really well and, and you know how I feel about linseeds it's also really useful but there's no evidence of, of what they're talking about here um, there's no evidence to suggest that uh, uh, to support the, the claims that are made there's a little bit of evidence with linseeds that if you take linseeds that it can increase that that cycle length and we see that in perimenopausal women where their cycles are getting a bit shorter so probably that could be useful but there's this extrapolation that all the seeds would do that they're great seeds. They're going to be useful for fibre. They're going to be useful for sort of some micronutrients. But in terms of some of the things that are being claimed, I think we need to be a bit careful about that. Salivary testing. Uh, my understanding is that yes. you can't correlate them. No. Look, I think the whole question is around hormone testing. And, and, and I think what that leads to is, again, appropriate treatments because you're going to try and look for something. Well, and people get that. fixated yes, on, the, on yes. the actual levels yes. and, uh, and, and not about whether their yes. re symptoms, symptoms are relieved yes. or whatever. Yes. So absolutely <clears throat> testing to make sure, you know, thyroid's okay, you know, like absolutely testing to see that nothing else is causing what we've got in front of us with the menopausal picture. Um, but, you know, and also I don't need to test someone's cortisol levels to show that it, to treat stress if they're presenting with stress, you know, with stress symptoms. Mm -hmm. So I think there are, there are some limitations with the testing particularly. Um, and what about buying herbal remedies over the counter? Yes, look, I think you can get it lucky, but I think a lot of combinations are putting in um, several herbs to try and do a one size fits all. Uh, sometimes I pick up formulations and they're great. Sometimes I pick up formulations and they have Vitex in them and that's not going to be great for a postmenopausal women. I, I think you have to, again, seek the advice of someone who knows how to use these, these treatments. You might get lucky, but it might actually be better. As we know from that study, women are often inappropriately self-prescribing. Exactly. All right, well, I think we've hit the time for questions. And um, I've got a question here. Why hops is recommended for anxiety but contraindicated in depression? Yes. Look, it's interesting. It's the old herbal textbooks that talk about it being useful for, um, like, uh, contraindicated for severe depression. Now, I, I see the students in the last couple of decades, they don't even know that as a contraindication. So it's probably something that it worsened that depression but it, it is particularly useful for, for anxiety, not, not indicated for depression generally. There would be other ones to use. Um, we have a question here. Is there any evidence that progesterone can help with perimenopausal symptoms? 
Um, so one thing we didn't mention in the perimenopausal symptoms was heavy menstrual mm. bleeding, which can occur because of anovulatory yes. cycles. And so in the perimenopause, depending on what the complex of symptoms are uh, as to whether progesterone or a progestogen mm. is needed. So if somebody's got heavy menstrual bleeding in which they've got um, uh, some thickened endometrium, they've been investigated for um, endometrial hyperplasia or, or endometrial carcinoma, uh, and the uh, curettings have shown um, proliferative endometrium but no hyperplasia, then you would use some progestogen in that phase. Mm. So you would use it for cycle control, but if a woman requires uh, treatment for hot flushes and sweats, you would use the progesterone there in a cyclical manner. And thirdly, you may actually use or, or use a marina, mm. uh, one for contraception because contraception is important in the perimenopause up until 12 months if menopause takes place 50 or over 50 and two years if, it, if menopause takes place under 50. Mm. And so therefore the marina can act as uh, protecting the endometrium can be part of the project can be the progestin in hormone therapy and also can be contraceptive in the perimenopause. I wonder Liz whether that question was a throwback to the the natural progesterone <coughs> being useful for everything to do with menopause and every other women's health condition back yes. in the 90s and unfortunately we are seeing this resurgence of where natural progesterone <coughs> is promoted for symptoms at menopause and and you know, PMS and a whole range of things yes. as well. Well, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, it's it's really counterintuitive yes. to use progesterone for PMS, mm. seeing PMS occurs when women have ovulate. And so therefore they're, they're having their PMS in the luteal phase yes. of the cycle, which is due to progesterone. Mm. If you stop ovulation, then PMS, true PMS, yes. should in fact decrease mm. or diminish yes. completely. Mm. Look, uh, yes, absolutely. Mm. Um, the next question um, is, um, is it safe to start? Oh, this is a question for me. I better yes. give one to, for both of us. I'll do that one. Um, is it safe to start, safe mm. to start uh, MHT with the beginning of the first symptoms of the perimenopause or is it best to wait till a menopause sets in? Well, I think the answer to that question is it depends on the degree of symptoms, what they are, and how much they're impacting on a woman's quality of life. They may not need to start on MHT at the first sign of symptoms. It depends on the degree of their symptoms and, and the actual um, intensity or quality of mm. them. Would you, I mean, how would you manage someone? How, what would you be your criteria yes, to start again. prescribing some it's, of the complementary mm. medicines when the symptoms are bothersome yes. so like for example yeah i think yeah, that's, I think that's a lovely main, word yes. when they're bothersome so for example a woman might be, be getting one or two hot flushes and they're not bothersome but you know a few months down the track there's been three months since her last menstrual period and she's getting night sweats and sleep disturbance and comes in and says you know i need to do something about my sleep so yeah when they're bothersome yes yeah. good i think that that's a really good question bothersome yes um another question uh i think is uh, really a very interesting question because I think it also um, brings in the definitions. And the question is, pre-menopausal woman diagnosed with adenomyosis, what is the best management plan? Mm. Well, pre-menopausal means that they're not in the perimenopause, they're having regular cycles and they're before any aspect of the menopause. So I really think that our focus tonight is on the perimenopause and the postmenopausal period. So that raises the issue of what happens to adenomyosis mm, yes. in the perimenopause. And because of that swinging nature of hormones, in fact, adenomyosis can get worse mm. in the perimenopause when there are for example, very high levels of estrogen, such as in the loop events uh, with, with the double ovulation. Yes. And so therefore, the, 
if you talk about the best management plan depends on mm. what other symptoms she has in the perimenopause or in the postmenopause. We know that oestrogen stimulates, oestrogen and progesterone stimulates adenomyosis. It stimulates the endometrial cells. And so there are re there's really only one conservative treatment for uh, managing adenomyosis, and that is uh, the hormone, the progestin releasing IUD, such as the Marina. And what the Marina does is it thins the endometrial mm. lining, so therefore it's going to thin adenomyosis as well. So in using a, a Marina, whether it be premenopausal, perimenopausal or postmenopausal, it will thin the endometrial layer and it will thin the adenomyosis, mm -hmm. the endometrial cells. And the uterus, if you re-ultrasound the woman after she's been uh, had the marina for a while, the volume of the uterus yes. uh, often decreases well. So I wonder if that's a question about is, is, is oestrogen therapy a contraindication with these women? Well, it's not if you if you use something like the marina yes. because yes, estrogen mm. stimulates it, and mm. so that's the important thing. Yes, um, brain fog. <laughs> we looked at this question and said, um. <laughs> "We both had a bit of word finding." Look, we know that there's research done on you know estrogen receptors in the brain, and you know that uh, my understanding is it's an adjustment period. The estrogen has to adjust to that transition in in um, word finding um, that that has to adjust to working at a different level. Look, I think the. I think it's reassuring to let women know that it, it is often a transition. But then when I said that to you before, you said, but sometimes it can keep going. Look, um, <laughs> it could be aggravated by sleep disturbance, you know, it, um, anxiety. Women are often got young children. I, I heard this terminology of sandwich parenting, where you're parenting young children and you're parenting your older parents. And so it could be a range of factors in that whole multifactorial. And, and, and with... The fact that people are having women are having their babies a lot later than they did in in my generation yes. or, and and older, um, and I thought of something and it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know. I remember at a lecture at the Australasian Menopause Society, one of the conferences on cognition, and one woman said that your memory bucket, the older you get the larger your memory bucket is. And so when you're trying to find a word, you're having to <laughs> scrape around in the memory bucket and in a, and the word might be right down the bottom. Yes, that could be reassuring, I think. Yes. So let's uh, finalise everything and say thank you to everyone for uh, participating and joining us tonight. You'll receive an email once the recording is available to view uh, in the Gene, on the Gene Howes website, webinar library. Remember to complete your evaluation uh, form if you need your CPD points or a certificate. Uh, and our next webinar next month will be on weight and obesity in women's health. And a link to register will be in the thank you email you receive tomorrow. Special thanks to you, Sandra. Thank you, Liz. Um, I always love working with you and I think uh, that it's so interesting and I always learn more information oh, from you, you every we, time. We've wanted to do this for a while. Yes. So it might and, be the first of many. And we look forward to seeing you the next time we have our little discussions. Thank you, Liz. So thank you all.